to Alibus 341 students. Hopefully you've had an opportunity to read my email that I sent out about what we have to do to complete the course. Um, and I'm, I'm going to reiterate what I said in my uh, uh, Zoom lecture to you. Uh, your goal right now is to complete the course and get as good a grade as possible. And my goal, stepping in for Azita, is to make sure that you get the best grade possible and complete the course. So we're on the same page. The things we have to do, uh, number one, we have to finish the lectures, chapters 15 and 16. Uh, number two, you have to submit your projects to me and I have to mark them. Number three, you have to do your presentations and I have to give you some feedback on um, not only your presentation skills, but the content. Then you have to do the peer evaluations, which is you know not terribly onerous, uh, but you have to submit them to me. And then finally, you have to write the exam and this is what this is about. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna get into chapter 15 now and it's called uh, Managing Vulnerabilities and Risk. Um, I teach uh, BAD M107, uh, Introductory to uh, Canadian Business Law, and, and, and the whole point of the course is risk management. So you see risk management in, uh, in law, you see risk management in uh, you know, um, this, this type of course. So it's pretty much all the same. Um, the definitions are slightly different. For example, uh, in my law course, um, risk is considered to be um, a possibility of loss or injury or a dangerous element or factor. Um, in this particular course, according to the uh, textbook on page uh, 210, it says risk um, is, uh, uh, where is it here, um, a hazard or threat. Slightly different words, but same end. Um, the only difference is that um, in this chapter, they talk about uh, risk management, uh, whereas I break it down in my course to uh, sort of four factors. Um, there's obviously, uh, you, you try to reduce management risk, you try to shift the risk whenever you can, uh, you try to eliminate the risk, or you decide at some point that uh, you just have to accept and retain the risk. Um, vulnerability in, the, in this particular situation means um, uh, you know, what is the potential risk and, and how vulnerable are you to that. Um, the, the book talks about uh, uh, what has disrupted operations in the past. Okay, that's great. Um, what known weaknesses do we have and what are the near misses that we've experienced? And I think the near misses ones is... Uh, is one thing that's really important because um, quite often you have a near miss, something that almost happens that, you know, whoa, whew, we saved the day. The, the difficulty with that is that the people involved say, okay, we just, you know, we better not bring that to the management's attention because, you know, they may get upset about, uh, you know, the, what almost happened. The, the problem with that, of course, is that the near miss is probably the indicator of what's going to happen in the future. And, uh, and so you want those near misses recorded and then you want to say, okay, what's the likelihood that that might happen again? Um, uh, resilience uh, is something that they talk about robust. Uh, robust is a strong um, constitution, the ability to handle these uh, problems as they come along. And then resilience is um, your ability to then, after some disruption in the supply chain, to then get back to the normal. Um, the agenda is uh, for this chapter is on uh, slide three, and it says how to manage supply uh, chain risk, uh, five categories of risk, which is really important and will be on the exam, uh, potential impact of those uh, risks, uh, trends in, and uh, technologies that are um, in, the, uh, uh, in the works, and then the security initiatives to, uh, to try to eliminate some of those potential risks. Um, the learning objectives, I think, is a pretty good hint of what will be on the exam. Uh, explain why uh, supply chain uh, risk vulnerability and resilience have emerged as important themes. Um, identify the sources of supply chain risk. Uh, what are the impacts that those have on the, um, on, on the business? Um, and then explain how to mitigate the risk. And then mitigate the risk is where I, where I say, you know, do you reduce, do you shift, do you um, eliminate? Uh, can you eliminate or uh, do you just retain the risk? Then we jump from slide three all the way down to slide 10 and I'm working my way through this so um, I will just go in there. Oh, actually it's, uh, no, it's more like slide, uh, 
um, 19. And then it starts talking about um, uh, bills of lading and airway bills. Um, and it, it says a legal, in the, in the book, it says a legal document issued by the carrier's uh, shipping line. Um, you really have to stop and think, um, you know, what it is. The, uh, the book talks about um, it being receipt for goods and a contract of, uh, for, for the transportation. In actual fact, it could also be, and this, this is very important to supply chain management, it can be um, uh, ownership. And why is that important? Well, if I was slipping, uh, shipping, <laughs> slipping, shipping um, a very uh, delicate uh, uh, computer instruments from uh, Canada to Australia, for example, um, I, I would want a straight bill of lading. I want that. I want the goods to leave uh, Victoria or Vancouver Harbor, and I want it in Sydney. Um, and I don't want any problems along the way. But if I was in uh, uh, Vancouver and I wanted to buy a shipload of Seville oranges from Seville, which is in Spain, um, I, maybe I don't want them to bring them all the way to Vancouver. Okay, it would, I could bring them all the way to Vancouver and then I could sell them and then ship them out to various places. But you can actually use the bill of lading as one of those methods of making your supply chain work better. You can say uh, this is an ordered bill of lading rather than a straight bill of lading. Um, and that would allow you to have an agent on board the ship so that when it leaves Seville and it stops in, uh, 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 you know, perhaps New York, you could sell some of the Seville oranges and then it would stop in Florida and you could sell some and then it would stop in Galveston, Texas and you could sell some. It would go through the uh, 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 Panama Canal to LA and you could sell some and by the time the oranges, oranges or the shipment of oranges actually gets to Vancouver, you have hardly any left. So that would be a lot more efficient um, uh, and you can use the bill of lading to do that. So it's a receipt of goods and a contract of transportation and a document of title. Now an airway bill, um, because um, uh, you're not going to be doing the same kind of stops, uh, it's usually not a, a document of title. Okay, it's just a uh, receipt for the carriage of goods and a contract of transportation. Um, and the reason is, uh, you would, it would hardly make sense to have to try to buy a, an aircraft full of Seville oranges, have it land in New York and sell some, have it, it just, it wouldn't work. And so airway bills um, uh, aren't documents of title. Um, and now there is an article uh, called um, uh, what is a bill of lading? And it's very good and you should watch that because right at the beginning of this um, of these slides, uh, Azita was very, very pointed when she said that watch the slides or the videos because that, those things will be on the exam. So heads up, uh, watch the uh, 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 video on uh, the bills of lading. Uh, then the, uh, the next slide gets into um, classifying uh, logistics service providers. And um, uh, the first is, uh, the category is uh, freight carriers. And um, uh, here I think it's important to realize that they say freight carriers like Maersk or Hapag, Lloyd or Hyundai or Costco, um, they, they don't stop and talk about the three categories involved in there. There are conference lines, which, which are a number of shipping companies that agree to work together and have uh, set schedules and, and set, set rates. And there are economies of scale because if, uh, if uh, Costco has a ship going uh, somewhere and, and Maris gets a, uh, an order for some goods, uh, they can actually say, okay, Costco, you pick that up and bring that here and we'll pick up your goods over there and bring them there. So those are called conference lines. Um, and then there are uh, independent carriers. Those are, are companies, shipping companies that are not associated in a, in a relationship with other shipping companies. They do it on their own. Again, they have set rates and set schedules. Then there's a third one called tramp vessels. Um, and this can actually prove to be um, uh, good for uh, cutting down the costs in, um, in logistics. Uh, I had uh, uh, the pleasure of being a, an instructor for Kaplan University at uh, Open University in, in Vietnam, and they had few law textbooks at that particular point. So I came back to Canada and I collected law books that I thought might be good for them. And I had 33 boxes of books. 
Um, I contacted um, airlines and it was too expensive. I contacted um, uh, conference lines and they were too expensive. I contacted independent carriers and they were too expensive. I actually went to a freight forwarder and said like, oh, ooh, what do I do? And he said, uh, find a tramp vessel. Um, it's a ship owned by one owner <laughs> and he has like one ship and um, he has no uh, set rates and he has no sh set schedules. So I could actually save a huge amount of money by shipping my box of 33 boxes of books on a tramp steamer. The problem is the trans tramp steamer, um, they don't uh, guarantee a date of delivery and, uh, and you have to work out the cost with them. So there are advantages in both. Um, if it's a certain date that has to be delivered by, then you don't use a tramp steamer. You would use one of these other freight carriers. So you have these freight carriers um, and then you have an, a, an organization um, or businesses that don't own the ships, but are um, carriers in this own, common carriers in the sense that um, they buy space on ships. And, and what they'll do is they'll say, okay, um, uh, I've got some goods uh, here and I'll put it on that ship there and we'll get it to there. And so they don't own the ships, but they own the space and they know because of the rates and the schedules where it's going when. Um, and um, they can always arrange ocean transport for you. Uh, they are called non-vessel owning common carriers, NVOCCs, and I'll bet that's on the exam. And then you have freight forwarders um, who help you do this. Okay, so you sit down, you go, okay, I've got these goods and I want to get them there. What do I know about conference lines, independent lines, um, tramp vessels, and and no, uh, what would you say, no, no cocks and, and NVOCCs? Uh, well, very little, um, and I may learn as I go along, but initially I need the help of somebody, and that's where the freight forwarder comes in. Um, freight forwarders arrange ocean, air, or um, inland transport. Inland transport means either uh, uh, trucks or rail. Um, and then there's integrators, courier companies, that's uh, FedEx, uh, UPS, and DHL, who um, do it all. Okay, you just call them up, you say you've got a parcel, you want it to go, and they take care of everything. They may, um, if it's a large something, they may arrange to have it shipped um, uh, by a by a ship, um, or if it's small, and generally is, uh, you have it shipped by air, and it just goes through no problem at all. Um, okay, uh, so that's that one. Let's uh, get to the next slide. Oh, the next slide just talks about non-vessel owning common carriers. They buy space, and uh, and then they work from there. Okay, there is a video on uh, NVOCCs, and uh, you should watch that because, as I mentioned, it will probably be on the exam. Um, they, they issue their own bills of lading, whereas uh, the other companies would be uh, using their bills of lading, but there's no significance to that. Okay, example is Tunegel. Um, uh, they don't, do not only own any ships, but they manage space on other ships. Uh, airplanes, uh, trucks, and railroads. We have a uh, video on uh, freight forwarders, so I'm not going to uh, talk about that, but um, uh, you just watch the video and make sure that you take notes on that, because um, as uh, Azita said in one of her slides, uh, these slides are not your notes. These are just um, her lecture guides, and you have to take notes as you go along. Um, okay, choosing a logistic carrier. Um, the uh, slide uh, 28 talks about a uh, number of factors, and this could work into one of those five mark questions towards the end. Factors that you take into consideration, and um, uh, you go, you know, cost and costing approach uh, um, speaks for itself. Terms of carriage, uh, applicable inter inco terms, and insurance, which we'll get into a little bit more later on. Speed and transfer time. That was what I was, what I was talking about when I was saying about the shipment of of those books to Vietnam. I couldn't have cared less when they got there as long as they got there. Um, and so uh, speed was irrelevant, transit time was irrelevant, and I would kick back to the first factor, cost, because the university was paying for it and they wouldn't uh, and they wouldn't pay very much to do it. So we had to struggle and get the books there somehow. Um, okay, uh, you, you just look down the list um, and you should uh, 
Um, I don't know uh, how Zeta works on our five mark questions, but on my exams, I would say, hey, look, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven things. So, okay, I could say, what are five things that you would look at when you're um, trying to determine uh, which carrier you should use? Uh, cross docking, again, there's a nice video on this. Um, cross docking uh, requires um, a fair bit of management expertise, which they don't get into in the video. Um, but the idea is that a lot, of, a lot of businesses, you know, buy products and they're, and they're going to bring them to their warehouse and then they're going to ship them off to distributors wherever they are. And so they bring them into the warehouse and they store them and ship them. Um, well, if you are more efficient and if you have a algorithm in your computer that can handle this sort of thing, then the idea is that the, the goods come in, but they don't go into storage. They come into your warehouse and they go right through your warehouse to the dispatch and then they go off to the client. And there's all sorts of benefits of that, obviously. The first one is um, uh, warehouse space is incredibly expensive. So if you're leasing premises or if you have your own building, uh, <clears throat> the um, you, you could have a much smaller building or you could lease much smaller premises so that you could handle cross -dock docking services. Um, and uh, there's a video that says it reduces the costs associated with damaged inventory. Um, that is, you know, obviously, um, the more times you pick up a box with uh, um, uh, merchandise in it and move it, the more times there's a likelihood of the box being dropped or bashed or something falling on top of it or the, do uh, the box disappearing because of uh, theft. Um, and so, Obviously, if you reduce the number of times that that particular uh, product is handled, then obviously um, you're, you're going to have less damaged inventory. Um, when shipping goods, where does the shipper's cost and responsibility end and where does the buyer's cost and responsibility begin? Uh, this is really basically ENCO terms. They are used um, very, very uh, much more often than, than uh, the common um, other day terms. Uh, the INCO terms is the International Chamber of Commerce's standard trade terms for the shipment of goods. Um, what happened was uh, there, were, there were a lot of uh, disputes in the marketplace because someone would be, would be shipping something FOB destination um, or FOB point of shipment and the other party doesn't really understand what that means. Um, and um, so FOB destination, well, I don't want to confuse you. Uh, I'd rather just deal with the ENCO terms, but there would be all sorts of disputes. And so the International Chamber of Commerce said, okay, let's help um, international business by getting a set of terms, uh, the definition of which is obvious. And so when you say, I want to uh, buy some of your goods, some um, FOB Vancouver um, Inco terms, then everybody goes, ah, okay, we know what that means. Or if you don't, you just hit a button on your computer and you look up Inco terms and oh, FOB Vancouver means this. Um, and it really breaks down to when the risk passes from the seller to the buyer and who pays for transportation. And um, the... Uh, um, slide says that there's 11 terms and we're going to only con uh, concentrate on three. Uh, in fact, I think there's more than 11 terms um, because there are terms relating to uh, the uh, shipment of goods by sea and then there's terms for the shipment of goods by uh, uh, truck or rail and then there's terms for the shipment of goods by air. Um, so, uh, Azita, for simplicity, zeroes in on three related to the shipment of goods by ship. Um, and there is, a, again, another video um, on the next uh, page. Um, sorry, is there or not? No, sorry, no, I was um, out of whack. There's no video, but um, we're going to um, uh, look at, uh, if I can just find... Yeah, out of the 11 terms, we're going to look at three. The first one we're going to look at is X works. So here's my factory, and I'm going to sell you something X works. What that means is you figure out how you are going to get some sort of transport to my business, and here's my loading dock. 
you back your truck up to it, and I say, there's the goods, you load it. So you load it, and as it goes over the back of the truck from the loading dock, risk passes to you, and you pay everything, okay? Um, that works out sometimes. The problem with that is quite often you have to negotiate these things, and the other party says, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. Um, <clears throat> So here I am in Vancouver, here's my warehouse. There's the dock down at the port. And there's the ship that this person wants those goods put on. Um, and, and so what they do is they say, okay, instead of X works, um, we want this to be, um, which is on the next slide, um, FOB. So FOB means free on board. No, it doesn't actually. F FOB the, is the acronym for free on board, but what does free on board mean? Free on board means I have to get the goods from my place of business down to the dock. So I pay for that transportation and I'd better get insurance on that because the goods are at my risk. Then at the dock, as the goods are taken by the crane and it goes across the rail of the ship, risk passes to you and the responsibility to pay for shipping passes to you. Um, <clears throat> quite often businesses will say, well, look, I don't know anything about shipping goods. I want to buy your goods, but I want you to take care of those things. And that's when the next slide, CIF kicks in. CIF is cost insurance and freight. So, um, and it deals again only with waterways, all right, not rail or uh, um, airlines or um, uh, trucks. So cost insurance and freight means the seller delivers the goods again as it passes over the rail of the ship. So I have to pay for the transportation from my business down to the dock. I have to get insurance to cover that. And then I risk passes to you, but I arrange the insurance for you because you don't know how. Okay, you're buying my goods, but you don't know how. So I arrange um, for the uh, for the insurance. Um, and then <clears throat> the risk passes to you, so the insurance would cover uh, that I arranged for you. And I, I, I'm not sure what it says. Because seller pays cost freight. Yeah, uh, you, you pay for the insurance, okay? Because the goods are at your risk when they pass the rail of the ship. So why would I insure something that's at your risk? So anyway, obviously, um, uh, I arrange it all. I arrange the freight, I arrange the insurance, and you pay the cost. Okay, from the point when the goods go over the rail of the ship uh, to the destination. And the, going over the rail of the ship is actually, you know, very specific because um, there was a, um, a case in the United Kingdom, uh, and again, because I'm a lawyer, I know these things, um, <clears throat> that um, they were loading aircraft tenders that were going to go to India. Now, an aircraft tender is actually a fire truck that they use at the uh, airports. Okay, but instead of you know hosing water, they spray foam. So India was buying a number of them, and they, um, they one of them was being loaded um, uh, because it was in the Thames Harbor. It was actually not from the dock, but uh, it was on a, a barge. And they brought it out to the ship, and it was being loaded onto the ship, and the chain broke, and the one of the tenders went right on the rail of the ship, and it was sort of going. And the judge, when he was making his uh, judgment and writing his decision, said he could almost imagine the people on the dock going, because if it fell into the water or back onto the barge, the United Kingdom Corporation would have to pay. If it fell, if it fell onto the ship, then, uh, uh, then India would have to pay. So that's how specific it is. So the three you have to know is X works, FOB, and cost, insurance, and freight. All right, then it gets into something that um, I find kind of bizarre, but um, you better know it. Um, and that is, um, let's see if I can find the relevant pages. Um, uh, Romstead, who was the uh, security person for um, uh, President uh, uh, Bush um, talked about known unknowns, knowable unknowns, and unknown 
or unknowable no unknowns. <laughs> I can't even say it. Anyway, he managed to say it. And what he meant was there are unknowns which we know about. And so we can factor those in. Uh, and then there are known unknowables um, Pardon me, there are known unknowables. Those are the things we know about and we can factor them in. And then there are knowable unknowns, those that we really haven't thought about. But if we actually turned our mind to it, we could figure out that there are factors that we should look into. And then there are some things that you just, uh, you know, have, have no expectation of happening. And these are called unknowable unknowns. Something that could happen that's beyond your ability to predict or investigate. Um, and so... Um, uh, on slide uh, uh, 37, she says, what do these words mean? Can you give an example? Um, good luck on that because I had a hard time understanding them. But if you watch the uh, video, it might give you some idea of, uh, of what those might be. Um, okay, so 50% um, of all suppliers are located in four countries. And this... Um, um, you know, the United States, uh, certain countries in, the, in Europe, uh, but predominantly uh, Taiwan, China, U.S., and Japan. And so that means that what you have is a whole system that's built on getting goods from those locales to other places. Um, and, uh, and that causes conniptions because you then have to um, uh, work on your supply chain vulnerabilities. And, and they, have, they have increased substantially over the past. Well, they, her slide says two to five years, but I, in fact, it's not quite true. I think the uh, vulnerabilities have, incur, in, have increased since 2011 um, because uh, terrorism has become an incredible factor involved in these activities. Um, uh, wars uh, breaking out um, all over the place have caused all sorts of problems. And um, so when you, by the time you get to slide um, 41, it says uh, business leaders cite multiple sources of supply chain vulnerability. And uh, that's a, an incredible diagram. Off to the right, she says, what information stands out to you? Well, it talks about demand uh, variability, uh, sole sources, long input times, low just-in-time inventory, and they go down the list. Obviously, the ones that stand out, at least to me, was demand variability. Um, and in the chemical industry, uh, chemi chemicals are used in all sorts of manufacturing, chemicals are used in uh, food production, chemicals are used in, uh, in farming, chemicals are used in, uh, in the production of um, you know, plastics. And so, obviously, uh, demand, demand variability is incredible. Uh, and causes problems in the supply chain. The other one that really, really stands out is sole sourcing. Um, and um, the uh, diagram shows that um, uh, it is pharmaceuticals and medical devices. And uh, boy, don't we know that. Um, COVID strikes and suddenly um, pharmaceutical companies in the United States are developing uh, vaccines and they need all sorts of, um, uh, you know, I don't know what they call them, but the incubators, the, uh, uh, the, the all sorts of um, uh, materials so that you could grow cultures and you could test them. And hey, those came from another country. Uh, N95 masks, um, the, the best protection. And they were all made by one source. Um, and I believe it was China. Uh, and what you have to do is plan ahead. Now, as soon as COVID hit, um, my very clever wife um, went online, found sources, and bought masks, had them shipped to us. And then the rest of humanity are going, give us can and advice, we can't have anywhere where are they? And, and, every, and what, what was astounding to me was um, that we were always trying to buy them from a source that couldn't supply. And I'm not sure how difficult they are to make, but when I look at them, I go, hmm, cannot be too difficult. And um, it was an incredibly long time 
before the marketplace responded so that the supply chain problems that we couldn't get these were eliminated. So those are the kinds of things. I mean, how, how do you know that there's a possibility of a pandemic? You know, wow, just like that, out of the blue. No, we had the SARS pandemic in about 2005. And we had all these basic problems. Oh, supplies of pharmaceutical supply um, and medical supplies. You know, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And do we respond? Do we prepare? No, because we really didn't stop and look at managing vulnerability. Um, and I'd be really surprised if uh, the Canadian government has done anything about saying, okay, um, if this happens again, or if another uh, variant of COVID comes out, um, do we have enough N95 masks or KN95, which is basically a knockoff? Uh, no, we won't, but have we done anything to do or prepare for it? No, we haven't. And everybody sits back and says, oh, the government will save us. Well, um, the Canadian government uh, entered into a contract to buy N95 masks and um, uh, other countries, and I won't say which ones, came up and said, hey, we'll pay you more. And so the companies, even though they had a contract with Canada and were supposed to deliver, they just sold them to this other, uh, these other countries. Um, and, you know, what, what are you going to do? You, are you going to sue the only people that can supply these? Yeah, I don't think so. So we were on the hook. Okay, so that's what you call about supply uh, or managing vulnerability. Um, it shouldn't be just up for the governments. Um, there should be some businesses that are saying, wow, you know, COVID, I mean, what, we're, we're heading into our third year and we've got all these variants. We're, we're going to need more and more and more of these things and, uh, and begin to respond um, and have better supplies closer at hand, less supply chain problems. Um, Supply chain risk is break, broken down into uh, four categories, and I'm just going to take a short break. Okay, I'm back after a short break, but then in this video you won't even notice that I was gone. Um, but now we're getting into, um, let's see, what is it, slide number uh, 45, and it's called supply chain risks, and it goes, breaks into five categories. Um, there's systemic risks, market risks, operational risks, and credit and liquidity, actually four, not five. Hmm. She says five, but in the book there's only four. Curious, um, maybe there's five on our, our slides. We'll work our way through. Uh, systemic uh, risks affect the global supply chain as a whole. Okay, these are things that are, that are you know, very large occurrences, such as um, uh, hurricanes, uh, uh, government policies, war, terrorism, uh, coup d'etats, which is governments being overthrown, and piracy. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, give me an example. Well, how about the Russian-Ukraine uh, war? Um, suddenly, Europe is uh, struggling to have um, uh, gasoline and heating fuels. We're heading into winter. Uh, Putin's uh, turning the screws. Um, You know, and uh, and the supply chain is is broken, um, but you know that's that's on a large scale. Um, but even on a, a smaller scale, um, these things can happen. Piracy. Um, you know, ships are being uh, boarded and taken um, off the coast of Africa, uh, <clears throat> in the Strait of Hormuz, um, uh, in the in the Strait of uh, close to the Philippines, uh, not Philippines, Indonesia. <clears throat> and, uh, and it's a real problem. I mean, all you have to do is look at the, uh, the movie uh, with uh, Tom Hanks. Uh, he's the captain of the cruise ship, and it's taken over by Somalian pirates. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, good movie, but it's, uh, it's a true story. So these things can disrupt uh, uh, things uh, quite quickly. The, um, uh, the floods and slides in interior of BC cut off supplies uh, coming uh, uh, from uh, the east and, uh, and also uh, materials going from here to uh, Ontario. <clears throat> so um, those are the kinds of things that are uh, systemic risks and, and basically it's system, okay, is the key. If you can't remember systemic, just remember system. The whole system is impacted or a large portion of a system is impacted by these kind of things. Um, market risk affects the operation of a specific sector of the economy. 
for example, this would be um, the, uh, the oil and gas in Eastern Europe um, because of the Ukraine war. Um, but it can be something even uh, less uh, expansive, like the uh, change in consumer tastes. Um, uh, the uh, Hudson's Bay Company, for example, in 1979 stopped selling furs for the very first time, which is what it was created for in 1643. Why? Because of consumer taste change. And suddenly, hey, you know, we don't want to kill uh, uh, wild animals for their furs. And uh, bingo, <clears throat> suddenly their, uh, their whole uh, supply chain system changes and they have to uh, uh, change the way they do business. Operational risks affects the operation of a specific supply chain. Um, delays in deliveries, forecasting errors, failures in production quality, things like that. Um, to, to give you some idea of how these things can uh, have a large impact, of course, and then a smaller impact, we just have to look at the floods and uh, slides that occurred in BC. Um, I, I, my wife and I were building a house in Seashell, uh, where I am talking to right now. Um, and uh, we were at the point where the, uh, the house was basically completed, but we needed the hardwood floors put down. And we have a contractor standing by to do the work. And then there's a slide, and our hardwood floor was on the other side. Okay, and it could not get through to Vancouver. It couldn't be brought over here. And so suddenly our house stops. Okay, um, so oh, like, you know, one single impact? No, it wasn't because the builders said, okay, well, no hardwood floor, we can't do anything until it comes, goodbye, and they left. Um, and, and suddenly there's delays in our house being done. Um, suddenly there's credit and liquidity. There could have been credit and liquidity problems because we're, we're you know, where, where are we living while we're having our house built? Had we been renting, fortunately we weren't, but had we been renting, there would have been uh, um, cash flow problems. Um, and the builder, you know, okay, you know, he, he just goes off the job. Well, yes and no. I mean, he goes off our job, but does he have another job available at that particular point in time? And what about the work crew? They, he lost part of his work crew because they said, well, we can't wait around. So they went and worked for other um, projects. And so it impacted his business. It impacted our house. Uh, and it could have been uh, credit and liquidity problems. Uh, raising, uh, uh, arising from collecting payments uh, from clients um, or actually having the funds to pay out. The, the builder, of course, we had, we had outstanding bills from the builder and, and uh, you know, had we had liquidity problems, it would have been difficult to pay him. He wouldn't have been able to pay his crews. So you can see how those things impact everything. Um, and by that, what I mean is you have systemic, market, operational, and, and uh, credit and, and liquidity problems, but they're not necessarily um, mutually exclusive. Oh, one happens, but it's a st systemic one. So no, no, there can be, um, it can be a chain reaction, a supply chain reaction. Oh, gee, I should coin that phrase. Uh, anyway, um, that's on page 243, and, uh, and you should know that uh, um, you know, for the exam purposes, for sure. Okay. Um, on page 245, as I was reading through, um, we, were, we were talking about um, negative, the impact of um, supply chain problems. And, um, uh, you know, and, and I thought, wow, you know, these, these things I have, you know, like, personal examples of them. Um, on page uh, 244, it talks about the Whirlpool uh, company who made um, uh, uh, dishwashers. And they have to have, a, obviously, a good seal on them to stop them from leaking. And, um, uh, and they were doing it all in-house. They were um, vertically integrated. They, they had the, their own suppliers of rubber and they were making them and then they had their own uh, delivery systems and everything. And then they decided to save money by outsourcing. Um, and so they outsourced the making of the seals to, I think, uh, China. I'm not sure. Um, it's irrelevant, though, where they outsourced them to, but they did outsource them. And uh, they saved it something like uh, $2 million a year. Wow, that's significant, right? Um, and then the uh, supplier, the company that supplies them with the seals, 
changes their supplier and they have a new type of um, uh, rubber, uh, plastic, I guess, not rubber, um, for the seal. No, it says uh, rubber seal. I don't know whether that's actual rubber or whether it's um, just a, a synonymous with rubber. Uh, anyway, they, they change and the that particular rubber dried out in um, uh, dry climates and would shrink. And when they shrink, uh, of course, there would be leaks. So the $2 million saving was good for a couple of years and then suddenly had all these washers being returned. Um, and, and, and suddenly I go, ah, yeah, uh, my wife and I have a place in Mexico. We have a dishwasher. Um, and I'm going to go down and see whether it's a Whirlpool uh, um, uh, later on uh, in the uh, new year. Um, but it's kind of curious because we got down there and we started up the dishwasher and it leaked. Um, and we, um, uh, my very clever wife said, okay, it's the seals, they've dried out, but we just put water in it. And we ran it a couple of times, mopped up the floors when it leaked, and then the rubber expanded and everything's fine. So now what we do is every time we leave our place in Mexico and we come back, we put extra water in the dishwasher and then close it up so that it remains moist. Um, a, a easy solution, but um, most people don't do that. Most people say, hey, it, the seal's leak, I want a new seal, and, and Whirlpool has to do that, and it costs them a lot of money. Um, the other negative impact, of course, um, that the book talks about on page 245 is the, um, uh, the hoof and mouth uh, disease that infected cows in the UK, and there was also some very minor problems in uh, Canada. And, um, uh, and, 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 you know, that causes supply problems, and and it goes down the supply chain. Um, so, you know, that's an obvious example. But then there's other like bizarre things that happen. Um, I mean, we can talk about COVID too. I mean, um, you know, COVID, uh, a tremendous impact on the supply chain. Um, companies like um, Maersk were, were uh, raping and pillaging because um, uh, there were all sorts of problems in shipping goods, getting them places, and so they just jacked up the rates and said, okay, this is our time to you know, rape and pillage the, um, uh, the system. And those costs get passed down the line to the consumer. So COVID's an obvious example of the impact of uh, um, uh, um, some factors, risk factors in the supply chain. Uh, but here's, here's a really bizarre one. I can show you how, how incredibly, I mean, this is one of the, unknown unknowables <laughs> that Runsford talked about. A good example, uh, if you have to use it on the exam, use it because I'll give you credit for it, um, seeing as how I'm marking it. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, Canada um, said to China uh, a few years ago, uh, hey, you're using lead paint on children's toys that are being shipped to Canada and we are going to stop the importation of all toys with lead paint until you change your system. And they also, you know, we also sort of gave them a slap in the face because we said we found, now found out that the people in the factories that are making, doing the painting, um, <coughs> pardon me, because the painting is so fine and, and that they're dipping the paintbrush in the paint and they'd paint and then they'd go to make a fine nib before they did it again. And then they were getting lead poisoning and this was being passed on. It either affected their house or it could be passed on genetically um, with um, children being uh, born with uh, defects. So hey, Canada's gonna stop that, right? So we, we did that and China immediately went, okay, for you, um, we're going to stop the importation of Canadian pork because of mad pork disease. There is no such thing as mad pork disease. But the disruption in production, or the disruption in, uh, we had the production, we just couldn't, uh, there was a break in the supply chain getting it to China because of government intervention. Um, and so as a consequence, uh, we actually had to back off and say, oh, well, okay, well, we'll allow the importation of a lead, uh, base or painted uh, toys for a period of time and then we'll eventually stop it, right? 
Um, and so there was, there was a disruption to the pork producers who go, like, where's that coming from? How do you plan for something like that? Um, and so that's one of Rumsford's unknowables, uh, or unknowable unknowables. Um, and I, I thought that was just a per, uh, 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 percolating in there. Now, um, the, uh, the bottom of page 245, it talks about um, creeping crises. Um, one of the creeping crises that I can see is uh, China's intention of taking, People's Republic of China's intention to take over uh, Taiwan. Uh, otherwise, it's a problem, you know, well, because 95%, I think, of all computer chips that the United States imports comes from Taiwan. Well, there's a crisis that is a creeping crisis and will cause conniptions in the future. Uh, okay, and then um, there are sources of external shock. Um to the supply chain. Um, and on, let's see, let's see, slide uh, 47, it talks about uh, COVID-19, uh, the market for zero car emissions, uh, the earthquake in Japan, um, uh, operational Mattel lead in the paint uh, on toys, which is the one I was talking about. And then, um, oops, I've just lost my place. Hold on, okay. Um, and then, uh, uh, we get to page uh, 246 where it talks about uh, 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 protests, blockades, and strikes. Okay, sources of external shock. Well, there's weather and other extremes. You can look at the hurricanes in, the, in Florida and the south of the United States, um, and that's a good example. They talk about short, shortage of key supplies, um, you know, the COVID masks, the whirlpool with its rubber uh, terrorism and other security threats such as piracy and kidnapping. I'm going to come back and talk about that because I've got a, another anecdote that I, uh, I want to share. Um, corporate accounting and scandal frauds. Um, the uh, you know the um, uh, Volkswagen uh, problems, uh, those things. Uh, bio threats. Um, action by upstream suppliers tarnishing a consignee's image, and uncertainty caused by the shifts in technology. Um, the classic example of the MP3 players and the cell phones, uh, that which were discussed earlier in the uh, course. Um, but I wanted to talk about protest blockades and strikes because we have that going on right now. Um, the Freedom Convoy protests that took place in Canada where uh, all these people were saying, you cannot force me to get a vaccine. And so they go, you know, all these truck drivers, uh, you know, they, they go on uh, <clears throat> this you know, protest uh, drive and and they disrupted the uh, supply chain. You know, making their point. Um, in actual fact, if if those people, um, I'm, I'm going to be really blunt here. If those people had half a brain, they would have stopped and thought it through to the end, because um, what happened was they disrupted the um, uh, supply chain. Uh, sending parts for American cars that are being made in Canada. And the United States looked at this and they said, wow, um, Canada is like a banana republic. I mean, I think they're more like a banana republic than we are because they almost lost their democracy uh, through stupidity and, and, uh, and, and voting for Trump and things like that. So it's like call, the pot calling the kettle black when they say we're a banana republic. The problem though is when they, when they were thinking that, they said, okay, if something like that could disrupt the supply chain and our ability to get parts, maybe we should start making those parts at home like we used to do, and then we would not rely on Canada. Why is that shooting <coughs> the truck drivers, uh, uh, why is that the truck drivers shooting themselves in the foot? Well. Okay, um, how do those parts get from uh, Canada down to the United States? They don't send them by ship, they don't send them by air, they don't send them by rail, they send them by truck. You know, and so, hey, you know, you can't force me to, you know, have a, have a vaccine, but by golly, I'm more than willing to lose my job because there's no parts to take to the United States. Um, so, uh, 
It just shows that you, you cannot look at any particular problem in isolation. There's always uh, other factors that come into play. Uh, okay. Um, okay, and on slide, uh, let's see, where are we? Um, okay, we're at uh, slide 52 uh, from child labor in the Congo to pollution and anonymous mining uh, can often shrug off a bad reputation. Um, there was a, a Canadian company that um, got into a partnership with a, 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 um, a company in Africa to do some mining. The company in Africa was hiring, no, it was not hiring. They were using slave labor from the prison camps. And uh, these people were being beaten and, uh, and, and dropping in their tracks and dying to do the mining. Uh, but they were, you know, it was really uh, inexpensive, obviously, this cheap labor. And the Canadian company was making a lot of money about it, uh, by it. And uh, there was a lawsuit against the Canadian company. And they said, hey, like, pff, it isn't us. It's the, uh, it's the uh, you know, the African country. And uh, the judge said uh, in that particular case, no, you cannot turn a blind eye to human rights uh, um, contraventions in another country and reap the profits of it. And so that uh, Canadian company got a very bad reputation. Um, the automakers uh, care a lot about what the public thinks. Uh, look at the Volkswagen problem. Hey, our, our cars are, um, you, know, uh, you know, so good at, uh, you know, uh, gas mileage or whatever it was. Um, and we've got all the, all the proof to show you and uh, you know it's all fabricated, okay. Um, so uh, there's a, there's a push for more transparency with respect to those kinds of companies, and and that comes as a cost to your reputation if you're uh, doing the wrong things. Um, so what do you do? Well, um, you can simplify your operations. Uh, you know, look at your product lines, uh, uh, try to use interchangeable parts. Um, uh, you know, I, I owned a Porsche 914 for a long time and uh, Porsche parts were so incredibly expensive, uh, but the, um, uh, the uh, mechanic said, hey, you can use uh, Volkswagen, a lot of Volkswagen parts because they're made in Germany and Porsche uses them, could be used in, the, uh, in repairing your car. So that's the kind of interchangeable part things you look at. Now that's an external one, uh, but inside your company you could say, okay, um, we're making Porsches, but um, uh, why don't we use a lot of Volkswagen parts in them uh, because they are less expensive and easy, easy to obtain. Focus where it matters. Uh, evaluate potential points of failure. Um, this is... Um, uh, this is risk management when you look and, and you try to determine uh, where your vulnerable points are. Um, you know, uh, uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Look for the threats. Um, map the flows. A lot of businesses don't really stop and think about the actual process of buying the goods, shipping the goods, warehousing the goods, getting them to the distributor, distributing them to the retailer. When they look at the, the flow, they can quite often see ways that we can actually uh, make uh, substantial uh, cost benefits for not only uh, the benefit of the company, but the benefit of the consumer. Then um, uh, share data with other companies. Um, this isn't necessarily data with, with respect to your proprietary interests. This is data with respect to your deliveries and, and vulnerabilities. And then you can come up with contingency plans. Uh, for example, in the United States, one of the biggest threats in the Southwest Southeast, rather, is hurricanes. What they did was they had contingency plans where um, firemen and uh, ambulance workers and health workers and uh, um, from all other states, um, they had a contingency plan to bring those in uh, and, and to help with the problems. And, and so they're helping people, yeah, but they're also um, helping with the infrastructure and getting the supply chains working so that they can get food in then they can bring in supplies to rebuild and things like that. Uh, practice drills. Um, it's always good to um, say, okay, I've got a plan. Um, and then something happens and you go, oh, wait, the plan doesn't work. 
And so what you want to do is you want to have a plan and you actually want to practice it a few times. And then maintain supply chain visibility. Um, I am going to be totally honest uh, with you. I'm not quite sure what that means. Let's see if it's on the next slide. Um, no. Um, so I think what we're going to have to do is you're going to have to try to read that in the textbook and find out what that is. Um, let's just go back and think it through. Maintain supply chain visibility. Um, I, I guess what you what you don't want to do is you don't want to you know um, hide your process from the world because um, if other people see what you're doing and you see what other people are doing, then you'll be able to. Um, uh, to share data uh, for a better result. That's my best guess. Um, okay, um, piracy uh, includes the tax on ships in the high sea. And, uh, you know, piracy is something you read about in novels. Uh, already, uh, but in fact, uh, piracy is a big deal. It's a, uh, <coughs> um, it's a problem that chronic poverty in, in countries uh, forces uh, uh, people into unemployment and then they look for um, other ways to make uh, money. Um, lacks legal regimes in Somalia, but again, it's poverty and unemployment there that uh, causes the problems. Uh, these people have no other way to make money than to try piracy. There are other examples. For example, uh, for other other examples. For example, Colombia. Um, Colombia is one of the world's uh, leading uh, producers of coffee, of course. Um, but years and years ago, before your time. Um, the coffee price began going up because um, people were, um, you know, there was a huge demand for coffee and the workers were starting to say, hey, come on, we want more than a subsistence living. We want to be paid more. And there was this huge movement in the United States. I can still remember where they said, if everybody in the United States has one less cup of coffee a day, we can actually drive the price of coffee down. And they did. Wow. Uh, the problem was that those people could not make a living making coffee or growing coffee. So what did they grow? Well, cocaine. All right. And it just enabled the uh, drug uh, problem. So you have to, you know, it's, it's like the uh, freedom convoy. Um, you have to think of the long term consequences of what you're doing. And try to figure out if, if you know, it's really, you know, worth what you're doing. Uh, so attacks on ships on the high seas. Um, there are more than 12 nautical miles off the coast and not under the jurisdiction of a state. Okay. Um, so the, the policing becomes uh, the French Navy, the uh, British Navy, the American Navy, and other countries. Um, there are a lot of underfunded marine routes, uh, uh, routes uh, where countries should pay for uh, this kind of protection, but they don't. And so consequently, there is a real problem out there. Um, uh, what do you think, uh, where do you think the hot spots are? Um, uh, you know, obviously the, uh, the next slide says, um, uh, oops, sorry, the next slide, oh, what, sorry, oh, what, sorry. <laughs> There is a slide. There it is. Um, it is slide um, uh, uh, 60, and it shows that it's um, uh, off uh, uh, the Cameroon and Equatorial uh, New Guinea, or Guinea, um, close to Africa and close to the Republic of Congo is a hot spot. The Straits of Hormuz is a hot spot, and I know that for a fact because um, my wife and I love cruising. And we were doing a um, Mediterranean cruise, and it was, and the ship was going to continue through the um, uh, pa uh, the um, Suez Canal uh, and go on to India. Um, and uh, we we had to go through the Strait of Hormuz, and a letter was delivered to every cabin saying that starting that night, all the outside lights in the ship would be turned off, and um, if uh, if there were any problems. Uh, people should immediately move from where they, wherever they are to the internal areas of the ship. Uh, and it was because of the potential of Somalian pirates. The captain also said that the next day the ship would slow down for a period of time just before entering the Strait of Hormuz uh, to take on some supplies and that nobody was to worry. 
Uh, and my wife and I were out on deck to watch the uh, loading of these supplies um, and because um, uh, we were curious. Uh, and the late, uh, an elderly lady beside us saw these things being taken off a boat and put onto the cruise ship. Um, and she said, oh, good, you know, that must be the cream, uh, you know, for, for dinner because we were getting short of, uh, you know, real cream. And, uh, and I sort of looked at her and thought, oh, whew, you know, uh, just keep thinking that lady. What it was, was they, they were loading on um, weapons, okay? Um, now, when the ship sails out of uh, a U.S. port, you can better believe that there's going to be very few weapons on board. Um, and so a British gunboat came alongside and loaded on weapons and ammunition and then we went through the Strait of Hormuz um, uh, and uh, nothing happened. Uh, nothing happened because um, uh, <clears throat> they, uh, they were taking precautions um, and they were also going at a very rapid pace. Uh, one of the things that they say here is that to, to prevent um, uh, uh, problems, you should, uh, you know, the ship should um, travel at uh, at least 19, um, miles, uh, nautical miles per hour. Um, the uh, ferry from Horseshoe Bay to um, uh, Gibson's uh, generally travels at about 19 uh, nautical miles an hour. Um, so it's not a, not a huge speed, but it takes a lot of um, energy. And so to combat piracy, of course, you are then affecting the environment because you're using more fossil fuels with the carbon emissions. And so there's trade-offs that we have to take into account, and that'll come, become a factor in the next chapter. Uh, okay, on slide um, 60, it talks about uh, ransom demands uh, generally are $20 million or $25 million for a $100 million uh, ship full of crude oil. Um, and then uh, they actually... Uh, uh, released $3 million payment to those people. Uh, that ship was en route to uh, from Saudi Arabia to the United States by way of the Cape of Good Hope, and it was under attack. She was about 450 mile nautical miles, or 830 kilometers, southeast of uh, the coast of Kenya, carrying 25 crew, and her tanks were fully loaded with crude oil. So this is a major problem. Um, there's a... Uh, a graph on uh, uh, slide 57 that uh, honestly I can't read on my um, my computer and I wouldn't imagine that it was too terribly important for uh, um, <clears throat> the exam purposes. But then uh, the next slide um, on page 59 says, uh, where, where are the number of incidences? Uh, there's many off the coast of Nigeria, in Indonesia, Singapore, Straits, uh, uh, Benign, uh, Ghana, Peru, and the Philippines. Uh, so it's a, um, uh, it's a real problem that uh, you have to take into consideration in your uh, risk management. The <laughs> pirates use technology. They can buy something uh, online really easily that tracks the location of ships. And on slide um, 63, for example, there, uh, there, there shows a ship finder uh, and it shows you the location of all sorts of ships and then you just download the information about what's on them and, and you know whether to attack them or not. Uh, you know, pirates are, are a little more clever these days than in the past. They're less likely to be targeted uh, and boarded um, at speeds of uh, at least 18 knots or over. Uh, there are no reported attacks of those. Um, uh, fuel is one of the largest operating costs, uh, and so traveling at that means about a 25% increase in the uh, costs for them. Um, fast steaming owners and operators spent $1.7 billion on increased speeds in 2016 alone. So suddenly there's, <clears throat> there's one of those vulner uh, vulnerabilities uh, that you have to take into account in your risk management. Um, you get insurance. Um, there's business interruption or loss of earnings insurance uh, for uh, chartered ships and ship owners and cargo owners. Um, uh, insurance, you know, I talked about it at the beginning, uh, you know, how you reduce risk, um, how you shift risk, how you um, eliminate risk, um, and how you, you may decide to retain a risk. Well, you have to ship the goods, you have to ship them by ship, so you retain the risk that there will be a piracy potential problem. 
Uh, there's no way you can eliminate that risk except not ship your goods by ship. Um, and so then you look for um, reducing the risk. How do you reduce the risk? You travel at 18 knots or more per hour. And how do you shift the risk? Well, you get insurance. Uh, the insurance will not. You can get a gazillion, billion dollars worth of insurance and it will not stop a piracy attack. But what it does do is it shifts the risk of loss from the business to an insurance company. Um, Uh, you have defensive equipment. You can reduce the risk uh, by having a long-range acoustic uh, radar, uh, which allows you, uh, or uh, acoustic device, which allows you to emit a very strong noise, which can disrupt the attackers. Um, you have um, hoses on board. Uh, you have guns on on uh, board. <clears throat> you can have security teams on board. But there was a there was an incident not too many years ago where. Some uh, Somalian uh, pirates uh, boarded a ship only to find out that it was a French naval vessel and they got on board and then there were about, you know, a hundred uh, French uh, uh, <clears throat> soldiers holding guns on them. Unfortunately, that didn't happen enough, but it could happen. Um, okay, where are we? We are on... Um, Yeah, and then uh, on slide 67, yeah, it says marine solutions, increase sailing speed, get insurance coverage, use uh, defensive equipment uh, and uh, have uh, security people on board are some of the risk management measures, okay? Um, There are global security measures. Um, there is the U.S. Customs Trade and Partnership Against Terrorism, CPAC, um, and you can actually um, uh, uh, register for that so that when you're sending your goods, you can uh, work with U.S. Customs uh, to reduce the likelihood of problems. There's the International Ship and Port Facility Security Initiative, the ISPS, um, and uh, then there's the Container Security Initiative, which, um, uh, which is a method of trying to uh, reduce the possibility of uh, containers being stolen or going missing. Um, and then there's the U.S. Container ISO 28000, a new security standard for supply chain security. Um, these are uh, um, uh, discussed on uh, pages 248 and 249. I don't know um, how seriously uh, um, Zeta would expect you to know this material, but I think um, uh, in light of the fact that you have a lot of time before uh, the exam, you might want to uh, look at pages 246 and two four, uh, pardon me, 248 and 249 uh, and make sure you understand those. Uh, okay. There is the U.S. Customs and Trade uh, Partnership Against Terrorism, that seat pack. Uh, why join and uh, what are the benefits? Obviously, um, you, know, you join because you're uh, you're trying to minimize your risk. Um, it re reduces the border inspections, okay, <coughs> because you um, <coughs> you uh, organize ahead of time what's what's coming, how it's going, how it's packed, where it's going to so that they can say, okay, yeah, we, we feel comfortable with that. And uh, there's no border inspections because border inspections then just allows for what they call either barattery or just theft. Uh, priority processing, you're gonna go through faster. Uh, supply chain security specialists uh, work with your company uh, to protect it and uh, uh, you can uh, actually attain their security training uh, seminars. Uh, the International Ship and Port Facility Security is uh, a mandatory security initiative. The International Marine Association is responsible for regulating shipping and marine safety. And so they've got this, uh, uh, this program that you have to uh, be involved in. Um, uh, and, and what you do is you contact your freight forwarder and you deal with them through them. Okay, deal with it through them. 
Um, Oh, the ISO 28000 Supply Chain Security is a voluntary standard certification program by a third party showing that a company has proactively established a security management system and has documentation to prove it. So the, um, uh, the uh, certification third party, which is generally someone from the ISO, um, will come and look at what you've done inside your business in order to, um, uh, to take uh, proactive measurements to establish a security system that would mean um, cameras or tracking devices and all those sorts of stuff. Um, and if you've done that, then uh, uh, you have documentation to prove it and your goods move quicker. Okay. Um, and that's all on in chapter uh, 15. Um, you, uh, you should look at the slides, you should look at the videos for sure because uh, Zita said that those things will be on the exam and um, uh, you uh, want to make sure that you uh, uh, look, at the, uh, look at the textbook, okay? And now that's all on this one. Um, I am going to uh, get this uploaded to the uh, uh, internet and I will send you the uh, code and by the time... You get that part of my message, you already know about it, so it's redundant. Um, but um, if you have any questions, uh, then uh, you can email me, and I'll try to find the answers for you. Uh, thank you very much.